Hi, I'm Dr. Sukeshi Patel Arora. I'm a GI medical oncologist at Mays Cancer Center. Today we'll talk about an overview of colon cancer. So we'll start with a review of colon and rectal cancer. So colon and rectal cancer may be used interchangeably, but they are part of the same organ. The risk of developing colorectal cancer is influenced by both environmental and genetic factors. And one out of 20 people will have a risk of getting colon cancer. So it's about 5% of the population. So it's, it is pretty high and common. So if we look at where the colon and rectum is, you can see that it's an upside U shape. And the left side of the colon is more referred to as the rectum, and the right side is more referred to as the colon. And in this organ, you can have polyps form at any part of the, the colon or the large intestine. So the first step of a polyp formation, you know, we have lots of dividing cells in the colon, and over time it can create buds or polyps, and you can see how it's very small there, or even pedunculated is what we would call it. And then over time, even up to 10 years, the polyps can grow over time, and as they become larger, they start to have more mutations and then start to go through the wall or start to move or invade through the colon. And if that's not removed in time, then the cancer can spread to other organs by sending off little field, fielders into the blood or the lymphatic system, and that's called malignant cells. And so you can see that if we can remove polyps while they're still very small, we can prevent colon cancer. And if we look at colon cancer and the staging, this is pretty much a basic cartoon of how we stage colon cancer. So stage one colon cancer is when the cancer has invaded the submucosa or the first lining of the wall of the colon as shown in this picture. Stage two is when the cancer starts to invade a little bit further into the neighboring tissues, mostly the, um, the peritoneum or the tissue that surrounds the colon. Stage three is when the cancer spreads to the lymph nodes and stage four is when the cancer spreads to other organs like the liver or lung, and that's when it's called metastatic. So some risk factors uh, we can change, and there are some risk factors that we cannot change. So we can't really change our age, can't change our gender, our race or ethnicity, or our family. And so there are some things that can lead to an increased colon cancer risk in our family, which are called familiar syndromes. Uh, we can't change the fact if we have inflammatory bowel disease that increases the risk of colon cancer. And if someone's had abdominal radiation in the past, it also increases the risk of colon cancer. But there are some things that we can change. Um, there are modifiable risk factors such as smoking, physical inactivity, uh, our weight, um, theoretically. Uh, so overweight and obesity increases the risk of colon cancer. Also, red meat and processed meat consumption increases the risk of colon cancer as well as al excessive alcohol consumption. So what can we do? We can also do screening. That's something that we can change that's in our power. And so by screening, we can remove polyps before they become cancer. And on the right side, there's a picture of what a typical colonoscopy may look like. Uh, it's a tube, it's a black tube with a camera at the tip of it. And the gastroenterologist or the GI doctor will move the the, the tube or the pipe through the colon to look for polyps. And on the bottom right side, you can see how if there's a polyp found, they can remove it through that procedure and prevent colon cancer. So when should we screen for colon cancer to prevent colon cancer? So for what we call normal risk, where there's not really high risk factors, we wanna start at the age of 45. And there are so many tests that we can do. So although the colonoscopy is the best procedure, there are other screening tools that we can use that can be used to identify either polyps or colon cancer. And so, so those include a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a shorter colonoscopy, or a stool-based test, which can be done at home. And so most primary care doctors can talk to you about that. If you have a high risk of colon cancer, which can include someone who has a family history of colon cancer, someone who has a history of polyps, uh, specifically polyps that have an adenomatous component, so that's something that's seen under the microscope, or if there's symptoms like blood in the stools, weight loss, abdominal pain, or changes in the stools, then that's considered a little bit more high risk and you should get a colonoscopy sooner. But in general, if you have some of these risk factors, we start colonoscopies at the age of 40, 
or 10 years younger than the youngest relative with colon cancer. So for example, if someone in your family has colon cancer at the age of 35, then that person's sibling should start colonoscopies at 25. So here are some easy rules for a colon healthy lifestyle. Choose most foods you eat to come from plant sources. Limit your intake of high fat foods, particularly from animal sources. Be physically active and achieve and maintain a healthy weight. And you should also limit alcohol consumption. So how do we stage colon cancer? So say someone has a colonoscopy and they find a tumor that's consistent with colon cancer. What do we do next? So an oncologist will usually order a number of tests to see if the cancer has spread. And so if a colonoscopy hasn't been done, that's done but also we order CT scans, particularly of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And if the cancer is in the lower part of the colon, which is called a rectum, we do more detailed staging with an MRI or an endoscopy. So how do we treat colon cancer? So for stage zero, meaning that it's like a pre-cancer, we do resection with the endoscopy alone. So like in the picture I showed you before. But in stage one, two, and three, we typically do start with surgery where they remove the tumor and the lymph nodes around it. And surgery alone is a very important treatment. The cure rates are very high with surgery, especially when the stage is lower. So when there's a stage one, the cure rate is about 85% with surgery alone. In stage two, it's lower. It's about 70 to 75%, so, but still pretty good. And in stage three, it's much lower at 30 to 35%. We also look at the role of chemotherapy. So depending on the stage, we may add on chemotherapy. So because stage one and stage two, the outcomes are pretty good with surgery alone, uh, many times we don't offer chemotherapy. But in patients who have stage two cancer that may be higher risk, and there's some features that we look at that are higher risk, we consider what we call adjuvant chemotherapy, which is adjuvant chemotherapy after the surgery and a typical regimen is called Fulfox. If there are certain markers that show um, that chemotherapy may not work as well, we don't offer chemotherapy. For stage three colon cancer, most patients are offered chemotherapy if it's safe for them. And in rectal cancer, we also add on radiation therapy at some point during the treatment as well. So what do we do for stage four colorectal cancer? So for stage four colorectal cancer, it's not as simple. We do need to do a little bit more testing to see how we can personalize the treatment for each patient. And that includes looking at uh, further testing and targets on the tissue or the biopsies or in the blood, which is called circulating tumor DNA. And so there's a lot of names for this, but we can call it molecular testing, next generation sequencing, or precision medicine. And so this is something that's very typically done when someone has stage four colon cancer. Options for systemic treatments that pretty much go throughout the whole body to treat and find the cancer include chemotherapy, targeted therapies, and in certain cases, when there's a marker called MSI high, we offer immunotherapy upfront. In what we call oligometastatic disease, which, mean, which means that there are less than about four tumors, we offer a combination of different therapies to remove the cancer and go for a cure. And that includes surgery, radiation, and other novel techniques. So for example, if the disease is only in the lining called the peritoneum, or is only spread to the lining, we may offer cytoreductive surgery and hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, which is called HIPEC. If it's spread to the liver only, in addition to surgery, there are newer therapies um, that have been revived. I guess they're not really newer, but they've been more revived, including hepatic arterial infusion pumps, or HAI, and liver transplantation is um, kind of newer in this domain. So how do we put all this together? So as clinicians, we work together as a team. We have a multidisciplinary cancer care team that meets every week. And we call this a tumor board. So you may even hear your physician talk about that. And who's at the table really matters. So we bring a lot of people to the table to discuss every patient's case, uh, especially the ones that may be a little bit more complex. So that includes a medical oncologist, a surgical oncologist, a colorectal surgeon, a radiation oncologist, 
a GI doctor, radiologist and pathologist who actually review all the pictures and images and the biopsies. And usually we also have a genetic counselor and a nurse navigator uh, to help us add on to the recommendations. So at Mace Cancer Center, we serve South Texas. And so what can the NCI designated cancer center do for you? So being an NCI designated cancer center, we have a lot of other opportunities that we can offer for patients and services. And this is um, by far not a complete list, um, but something that we think about for all of our patients who are undergoing a diagnosis of colon cancer. So we have a, a specific uh, GI specific dietitian who meets with the patients and works with them throughout their cancer treatment. We have psychologists as well as a rehabilitation center where we can uh, work with PTOT or also get patients ready for surgery if they're not quite ready yet. We have social workers and nurse navigators to help guide patients through their treatment from diagnosis to the end of treatment. We also have genetic counselors uh, and testing uh, in the building so that we can offer um, testing to patients who have a family history of colon cancer. We have specialized multidisciplinary tumor boards, including um, a focus on colon cancer that meets every week. And then we also have a vast array of clinical trials and novel therapies that are not otherwise available at the cancer center. We have palliative care services and special programs for adolescents and young adults, including fertility preservation and a geriatric oncology program as well. So finally, uh, as a reminder, March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. So get your colon cancer screening, and if it's not time for you, um, go ahead and get your loved ones to get their colon cancer screening, no matter what it is. And um, lastly, I'd like to just share some patient resources for patients and caregivers. There's some great organizations out there, including uh, Colon Cancer Coalition, Colorectal Cancer Alliance, and the Blue Hat Foundation that have lots of great information that's evidence-based. And I'd like to thank you for your time.